going up the pathway, the guy hadn't been listening to what the needs of the prospect were. The next part of it is overcoming objections. So what all of these objections mean, there could be a price objection, there could be we don't have time right now to look at it. It doesn't matter what the objection is, it all really boils down to one thing, which they don't yet see the value in what you're offering. And I'll spare you the graph on the, on the flip chart, but basically there's this resistance and your job over time, I'll do the best I can. Your job over time is to lower that resistance. So you have, this is R for resistance, this is T for time. And over time, you want to bring down the resistance, and at some point, there's going to be this point, which is a buy, a B for buy. So it's just figuring out, if someone's having, giving you the objection, or whatever it is that they're raising, you have to figure out a way to isolate that objection, and we'll look further into it yet. Um, with this long-lasting recession, yeah. The objection isn't just a low, wanting a lower price. Sometimes I just don't want to spend any money. Right. How do you? I mean, specifically, that's a big one today. Right. The customer has a need, but they learn to live without that need satisfied, and they're doing okay. They don't like it. But Sometimes they need to spend money to save money. Right. And also, maybe they just don't have the need. But there are people that don't. Have so that's an objection. But is this something they truly need? Maybe it isn't. If you got this far, it probably is. Sure. If you qualify the sale, qualify yeah. the customer, you're not even talking to them. They have no money, not a lot of customers. Right. So that would have come up prior to the presentation. Well, lots of purchases are financed, so they don't have money in the bank, but they might be credit. I understand that, but if you are a salesperson, you've already figured that out already before you've even talked to them. If they've said to you at some point, I have no money, then they're really not a customer. And then the idea would be to find somebody who is. Exactly. So they're not wasting your time or, or theirs. Okay. So, uh, you both help me. Thank you. Hey, today is that? That's, well, right. that's a sticking point for me. Right. One of the things about overcoming objections that I've always used as a, almost as an internal game, and it works really well for me, is I turn uh, lemon into lemonade, and I'll say to myself, uh, somebody, I'll think in advance, what are potential objections? And then I'll say to myself, but that's one of the best things. Right. Remember we talked about that. Right. And you turn that objection into a positive. Well, it's too expensive. That's one of the best things. It's expensive because it's more robust. Exactly. Whatever it is. So ultimately, they're actually spending less money over a period of time. Because if it lasts long, they don't have to repurchase. So a good example, price is probably, especially as you say, because the economy, price comes up a lot. So the idea on the price is, as an example, if someone's trying to sell a lease in car, and I'm sure you use this one, if they say, so I'm spending 300 a month right now on my lease, and I would love to get into a car that's $400 a month. But I just see that number 400 is way too much. That's something far beyond what I would ever want to spend. The idea of what the car salesperson would say is, what you want to do is have them not see it as $400. What you want to say is, it's the difference between $300 and $400. So it's actually only $100, because you're spending the $300 anyway. So suddenly, instead of seeing that number 400, you're now just seeing 100. And the idea is you want to break that unit down as low as you possibly can. So we've gone from 400 to 100, break it down even further and say, that's per month, per week. You want to translate that in terms of being 25 bucks a week. And then break it down even further, that's really three bucks a day. So if someone is not buying their dream car just for three bucks a day, suddenly that doesn't really sound, you realize, well, maybe I should be doing that. And then you can relate it to something else. Everybody goes and buys, somebody goes to Starbucks every day, just by not buying that Starbucks cup of coffee. Suddenly you've got your dream car for free. So is that, does that sound It like does, and then, and then go straight to the benefit. Right, exactly. So like fewer repairs, you know, might be a little better on gas. Right. Yeah. But you do, you break down that Absolutely. unit to make it smaller. Absolutely. Yeah. The biggest leap is from that 400 to 300, uh, 400 to 100 dollars, because you're spending 300, unless you go you're out already spend some money, you're spending sure. something on a car, right? And it all goes back 
to getting the information. You know, right. Because if you haven't gotten the information, you don't know, you know what, what they want, what they're looking for, and what their problems are. I remember quite distinctly, again, I'll go back to us in England, we, were, we bought hundreds and hundreds of thousands of plastic bottles every year. I had problems with suppliers. Salesman came in to see me. He made the assumption up front, without even talking to me, that my problem was price. My problem had nothing to do with price. My problem was, if I call up and order bottles, I want to get it the week. Right. Right. But if he, he didn't ask that question, so I never really got to talk to him about it. Exactly. Yeah. It's only getting the information. And then the close, which really, is, that puts a lot of salespeople off. The close is something they give a great presentation and they don't know how to close. The truth is you should be closing all the way along. And you close by getting agreements. So at the end of each benefit that you've talked about, make sure that they are seeing it. And the more they're nodding, the more they're saying yes. Really, it's just, in their mind, affirming that this is something I want to do. So then the close doesn't become this huge thing at the end. You've been doing it all the way along. And that's why ABC is always something worth remembering, always be closing. And if you've seen Glenn Gary Van Ross, that's what they talk about in the movie. So, and asking for the business, that's another huge part of the close. You can give, as I said before, this great presentation. If you don't ask for the business at the end, chances are you'll just head out and then that's the end of it. So you always want to either be closing. If that doesn't close on the, the day of the presentation, don't ever just leave. Just figure out what are the next steps. Always propose, well, let me check in with you. If they need more information, let me check in with you. Um, three days from now, I'll get that information to you. And then you can be closing again. But you always never leave without saying what are the next steps. That should always be in your mind. So we're just going to take a look now at Chris, who's a salesperson who starts out finding sales very difficult, but figures out a way to break down a lot of the barriers to make his life as a salesperson much easier and more effective. We'd like to tell you a story about a salesperson. Meet Chris. Everyone said Chris was made for sales. He was outgoing, persistent. His view of sales was that it was merely a matter of convincing people, persuading them, and overcoming their objections. It was all just a numbers game. Chris found a company with products he believed in. So his new company gave him training and all the tools. They told him exactly what he needed to do. But at the end of the day, he still had to be committed to knocking on over 100 doors a day. Chris does this, and here is one of his typical sales calls. Chris shows up and has only one thing on his mind. I need to sell. The buyer, on the other hand, not so enthusiastic. He's thinking, what do I need to do to not get sold to? So Chris starts the sales call, and he begins delivering his pitch, and you know what? He sounds like every other salesperson there ever was, because he uses the script and training that his company gave him. He doesn't do anything personally to connect with the prospect. He's just the company figurehead, telling this innocent and hapless prospect exactly what his company wanted him to tell the prospect, what the company does, and why they're the best. What Chris doesn't realize is that the buyer is trying to figure out who he is, who the salesperson is. Is this a trustworthy guy? Is this guy out for his own good or mine? Chris helps the prospect answer those questions because he acts like everyone else and therefore reinforces the stereotypes. Chris is unaware of how the prospect sees him. He believed he had to be Superman, parachuting in with all the answers. The prospect quickly becomes uncomfortable, crosses his arms, and puts up a salesperson barrier. Chris keeps motoring along, not realizing that all of his talking points are just getting deflected. Even questions aren't getting through. To the prospect, he's just another salesman. And we quickly get to the end of the sales call. No thanks, I'm just looking. When he hears those words, Chris's shoulders sag and all the air goes out of him. In the back of the prospect's mind, the whole time has been the idea that the seller's gain is my loss. And Chris, by sticking to a canned script, never got through that barrier. He just didn't connect. Undeterred, Chris would knock on more doors. And he repeated this over over and over again. He was doing exactly what his company wanted of him. He used the training they gave him and he followed their model. And he said to himself, I better get used to it. It's all just a numbers game. You know, Chris actually did make some sales, not because he was that great, but because when you knock on that many doors, you're bound to make some sales. But the rejections kept mounting 
and he realized that he couldn't keep doing this. So what he did was reflect back on the sales he actually had made, and he realized that in each of these sales, a connection had been formed with his buyer. He needed a way to put this into practice more often. So he decided to become a student of the game, and he wanted to find out, how can I get on the same wavelength with a prospect? How can I emotionally connect with someone on a human level, on purpose? The first thing Chris put his arms around was empathizing with the buyer's skepticism. He realized they put up barriers for very good reasons, and there had to be a way around those barriers. Next, he wanted to know how people made decisions, specifically buying decisions, and this led him to study the human mind. He learned about the left and right sides of the brain. The left is logical, rational, skeptical. It's adept with numbers and information, but it's the side of the brain that says no. The right side, however, well, that's creative, imaginative, visual. It's the side of the brain where we build trust. It's also the side of the brain where we say yes. He found the pathway that would get him around the left side and into the buyer's right side, and it was storytelling. It was a way for him to create an emotional connection, a way to educate, to inspire, to be hopeful. It was a way to build trust. He then realized he needed to learn the basic principles of storytelling, how to construct and deliver a well-thought-out narrative. He learned how to craft stories using a proven, universal structure of storytelling. He begins to build himself a toolkit of stories for any sales scenario. Stories about himself, about his company, and how a client could use his company's offerings, about other clients and successes that they've had in the past, and about lessons learned. Storytelling alone wasn't the ends, it was the means. He had to get the buyer's story, and he quickly saw that he was not a good listener. He learned he had to listen with more than just his ears. He had to incorporate sight so that he was in tune with the other person's feelings. He had to pay attention to body language. He was given an active listening model that contained the building blocks he could use in real life. The result? He became a more purposeful listener. Now Chris goes back into the field with a new approach. First, he recognizes his prospect's skepticism. Then he relaxes and tells his prospect a story about another person he's helped in the past. That then invites the prospect to tell him a story, and he actively listens. He finds out there's now an open exchange of information and new ideas. An emotional connection has been formed. He then realizes he can repeat this over and over again. So... Obviously, he did a much better job of figuring out how to do it. And what are some of the ways you feel made him a, a more effective salesperson? Some of the key ways. What's the biggest thing that he did that that guy in the previous one didn't? What they call listen. show up and throw up. Right, <laughs> <laughs> listen. And I, I, the other part is he was just human, he was real. So we talked about, we did the elevator pitch. It's not going to sound natural when we were doing it just in pairs. It's not going to sound totally natural. The key thing is to put it into your own, use the same formula, but put it into your own words to make it natural. Because people ultimately are going to respond if you're being human to them. People connect with other humans. They don't want just another salesperson, now more than ever. So Chris that figured out a way to be personal, to listen, but to realize that you make the connection by being, by being human. Any other points from that that came out? Well, he found his, um, I don't want to say crutch, but he found his crutch in getting the other, getting the uh, customer to engage. So he would tell a story and then that would prompt the customer to open up. Exactly. So I don't know if everybody can take that approach, but what is the approach? Well, there should always be some kind of a story. I think it, it stops you just being a nameless uh, salesperson. If you have a story, it helps create your brand as well. Not just about you, but about your company. So sort of giving off a testimonial at the same time? Is that That's a part of it, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, where your company came from, why it's the fact that it's local or something like that, something that means something to the prospect so that you stand apart. <coughs> so after the presentation, following up, as we spoke about, is so critical. And here, 79% of leads are never followed up on. 
which is astounding because leads are opportunities. And they need to be qualified, as John said about it being a numbers game. Although Chris realized it's not, what John was saying it is once a prospect is qualified. Once you have qualified prospects, then it is a numbers game. Then you just need to find those yeses. But when you don't follow up on leads, and most people are not doing that, it's a complete waste of opportunity. John. Uh, just a, a slide for that too. This is cool. We're resonating with our friend Michelle Glitter. The most successful car salesman in the United States is Guy Ford. He's, he makes a commission of a million and a half dollars a year selling cars. He does that because of his follow up. He constantly follows up with people that are buying any plays, but who do you know who get it? Right. And he keeps it all on records. He keeps it, and he, he sends out birthday cards. He calls them, how's your son doing that was in the hospital last week? You know, all that stuff which makes it a human connection. Mm -hmm. Because people don't buy from people they don't like. That's right. Right. They, they buy from people that they have made a warm connection. The first guy, one of the things that struck me about it is it was, it was sterile and disconnected. There was no more human warmth at all in that first guy's right. attempt at connection so with the not, idea. It's about human, it's about human relations. That's and I just want to touch on something on price, too. And my father wasn't in sales, but he told me this a long time ago, and it holds true. People can find money for what they want to find money for. In other words, I've had people come onto my lot who, can't, who say they can't afford a $200 a month car payment. And they're both smoking a $50 carton of cigarettes a week. So, and, and, and I don't have anything against smoking, but my point is this. If you show the value and you prove that it's worth it to them, regardless of whether it's home inspections or what it is, they will find the money for it. There is no question. I mean, there are some extenuating right. circumstances. If they see the value. If they see the value in it, yeah. and they want to find the money for it, I don't care if it's a, a drug addict that has a $100,000 a month addiction, he's going to find that money for it. Right. And it's the same with anything. If you can show the value in it and that they need it, they'll find that 400 bucks a month. Right. You know, it's... It, it, that's what it comes down to. That's why that's what objections mean. It really just means they don't see the value yet. Right. That's, that's the bottom line. Because it, they will find the money for it if they want. Right. So we talked about the seven touches. 80% of all prospects convert into customers after the fifth contact. So do you guys, do you have a follow-up strategy? Something that you have in place? Is there anything that you currently use? So I have a great one here for you in the next slide. This is one you may want to adopt. If 80% of all prospects convert to customers after the fifth contact, here's a good idea. <laughs> follow up. <laughs> and each follow up should obviously be something a little different. You're giving new information. But just don't lose that lead. Just keep in touch with it. And always be showing more value. And what you're doing is you're lowering that resistance and you're getting closer and closer to the ultimate buy. So, 48% of salespeople never follow up with a prospect, and 80% of sales are made on the 5th through the 12th contact. So it shows that this slide really is just to illustrate the huge disconnect between where salespeople may do a fantastic job initially, then they stop and then completely drop the ball just because they haven't followed up. And following up is really not that difficult. You've already made that initial connection. You've built a rapport. The person has built some trust with you and then you just let it go. So it's really an absolutely wasted opportunity. So what if you remembering to follow up? And I found, I've found that it helps if you establish that you're gonna, that you would like to follow up with that person before they leave on that initial contact. Say, listen, I'd like to touch base with you. I, I'm gonna find this information for you and I will touch base with you in a day or two. You know, and most people say, that's fine. Right. If there's a reason for it. Right. They don't want me to call them back and ask them about the weather. You know? Right, exactly. And a nice way to do that when you offer to follow up, you want to be in control, but let them feel that they're making... It's their decision, decision. whether I follow up. Right, exactly. If they tell me not to follow up with them, then I'm, right. then I'm not going but to. But the way to present it would be to say something like, How, why is it okay? follow up with you next Friday? How does right. that sound? Yeah. When they say yes, they're making the decision, but you've already been stayed in control. And they're anticipating that follow up. Right. Do you specify how you'll do it or give them the option? Give well? them the option. How would you like me to do that? The ball's in their core. Bone or Even though you're actually in control. 
What's that? Even though you're actually in control. Exactly. <coughs> It's me, it's me doing my job, but the customer feels as though they're in control. Right. And ultimately they are to a certain extent because if, with me, if they ask me, you know, no, I'll get in touch with you, then I'm not going to call. Thank you. Thank you. So we talked about failure, and Babe Ruth is a really good example. Like when you have setbacks, just see it as part of the process. And Babe Ruth, uh, is well known for in the, I'm not too up with baseball, so I could get this right, in the, in the season he had the record number of home runs, he also had the record number of strikeouts. So that's just saying embrace the fact that when you become successful, you're going to have failure along the way. You're going to have no's to get to those yeses. And if you can truly let that sink in, it'll just give you a much better sense of, uh, this isn't a failure, it's just a part of that place to get to a yes. So Kobe Bryant's a nice updated way I just saw this on Facebook last week, so I wanted to put it in. He's missed more shots than any player in NBA history, yet he's one of the most successful basketball players. So he realizes that you're just going to miss a lot <coughs> to, to get the actual uh, to get it loose. So following up is a really important part of the sales process. So is getting referrals. And this is talking about car dealerships, where I think they do it better than anyone in real estate is another area. Referrals are really, there's two great things about referrals. The first thing is, oh, they don't cost anything. You can spend a ton of money on marketing, but referrals is all word of mouth, especially in the state we have. Vermont lends itself to referrals and networking. So always make sure when you've made a sale, you've got someone who's now in your court, have them go out and champion what you're offering as well. And that's the great thing about it, it doesn't cost anything. It's also an instant endorsement. Of course, when someone's selling a car, they're gonna be saying what's so great about it their company and their cars, but when it comes from a friend of yours, that's an instant endorsement and it just means a whole lot more. So always be thinking about those referrals. According to the Word of Mouth Marketing Association, 65% of all sales are through word of mouth and referrals. Yet only 18% of companies have a formalized referral program. So if you don't have a referral program, it might be worth thinking about offering something like that, whether it's a percentage off, the person who referred to, uh, something like that. But just, obviously most people don't do that. It's something certainly worth looking at for your company. And customers are happy to give referrals. 91% of customers say they would give a referral, yet only 11% of sales, the sales people will ask for them. So they're pretty astounding statistics, and it shows what wasted opportunities there are out there every day. And just as an example of a very simple email that you could send out. Thank you for being a loyal customer. As you know, I get a lot of my business by referrals from great customers like you. Do you know anyone that would have some interest in our product or service? And always check the typos because it says thanks you for considering. So has anyone seen, I'm sure you've seen, Jerry Maguire. And there's a guy who just keeps showing up in that movie. Just They're like five second clips. So this next clip just puts them all together. It's 45 seconds. And it's this guy, Dickie Fox, who's kind of obviously the sporting agent guru. And he gives these little sales tips throughout. It's, he speaks a lot about what we've talked about today. So I just wanted to play that. And then we'll end today just for 10 minutes on just some random sales tips through my last 20 years, what's, what's really helped me and what I believe can help you. And if you just adopt just a quarter of them, there's no question it'll help yourself more effectively. So I just want to end with that. But this clip, Dickie Fox, just talks about just random sales things and talks a lot about the discussion that we've had today. I have a question about sure. referrals. Um, can you just speak a little bit to uh, incentivizing referrals? Sure. Sort of reward them. Yeah, so if you were to hand out your business card after a sale is made and say to that person, if you can refer me, to people and they become customers, then you'll give them maybe a discount off their next purchase, something like that. So maybe ten percent off. As an idea, does anyone do that currently? And if you do, yeah, what do you do? That's almost exactly it. If, if we have a web design customer that refers another potential client, which turns into a sale, we will uh, offer them that maybe we're either ten percent discount off of their next web design venture. But since that doesn't happen very often, we'll also give them the ability to actually take a cut of that sale. Right. And how does that work for you? It works well. Well, yeah. yeah. That's great. That's so an idea. One of the things that we've also toyed around, we're in the process of coming up with our 
the referral program is, um, but let's say uh, someone refers to us, the person referring can get the 10% off the mm -hmm. sale, but their friend who they're referring can get free shipping, you know, so that they're, they're also giving a gift to their friend by giving out their, you know, their friend's mm -hmm. name. So, um, but you know, we're kind of trying to develop it based on what is our cost of making a sale, what is our cost of a lead. Right, because you have to protect your margin as well when you're right. making something extra away. Right. Yeah. yeah. But it's absolutely worth something uh, it's worth looking into, for sure. So this is what Dickie Fox has to say. The key to this business personal relationships. I love getting up in the morning. I clap my hands and say, this is going to be a great day. Unless you love everybody, you can't sell anybody. Roll with the punches. Tomorrow's another day. If this is empty, this doesn't matter. Hey, I don't have all